Good evening, everybody. Uh, and welcome to everybody who hopefully is now viewing online as well. Everybody is equally welcome to this Joyce Jocelyn Hay annual lecture from the voice of a listening viewer. So you're very welcome. I think all that remains for me to do at this stage is to introduce Alex Mayon, our host, if you like, for the night, who's Chief Executive of Channel 4 with, uh, well, you all know, but basically a distinguished career in broadcasting, including a period as Chief Executive of the Shine Group before joining Channel 4 in 2017. And I shall hand over to Alex so she can introduce our speaker. Over to you, Alex. Sorry. Thanks, Colin. Channel 4's role, I think, is to provide the booze and a warm location, um, which is something we're generally quite good at. Uh, Channel 4 is also 41 years old. Uh, I, unfortunately, am slightly older than that. Uh, but it's interesting that it's the same as the VLV. So thank you very much for coming tonight. Uh, it's quite exciting uh, for me to hear this lecture from Baroness Kidron. It's an honour to have her here, um, talking about children's rights and the impact of online and smartphones is, for me, I think one of the critical issues of our time. I say that as the mother of four children and someone who's uh, running a youth broadcaster in perhaps the most competitive time. And I would say, in many ways, the most dangerous time um, for young people in the UK today, not only because of what they have access to, <clears throat> but also because of the rise of disinformation and misinformation and the multiplicity of choice foisted upon them often algorithmically, but certainly much of it without public service values at its core. So this is a, an issue that I certainly care very much about, and I know many of you will, but I have to talk about B-Ban. Uh, 30 years as a filmmaker, including films like Oranges Are Not The Only Fruit, which won three BAFTAs, uh, best including Best Drama Series, Two Wong Fu, Thanks For Everything, Julie Newmar, and Bridget Jones, The Edge Of Reason, which I learned today, some of Bridget Jones was actually filmed here in this very, very building. I met someone today who was involved in filming it today. <laughs> Still quite pleased about it, Alan. Um, and she's had a huge influence on our cultural lives during that time, not just making films, because in 2006, like getting on for 20 years ago, she saw that teenage boys were turning away from reading and she co-founded the charity Into Film, which now reaches more than two thirds of schools in the UK. And it's film clubs, screenings, resources and training that helps young people's development using film as the interesting way to do it. In 2012, the year that she went to the House of Lords, she started noticing what smartphones do to young people and what it does to their conversation and the ways they play and the ways they interact. She spent hundreds of hours filming children as they spent on time online, creating a 2013 documentary in real life, which was very early, really, to show the effects of how these things were affecting teenagers. She found indifference out there uh, and she found some people treating her like a middle aged woman who didn't get the new rock and roll of phones, which she thought was actually an injustice to that generation. So she's done a huge amount here already um, in perhaps recent years. Your work in it has been more <laughs> appreciated as other people understood more. She introduced an amendment to the UK's 2018 Data Protection Act, which created the age appropriate design code requiring online services to give the under 18s heightened privacy. And this has become a benchmark for future legislation internationally, including uh, recently, even in California in, 19, in 2022. So it's nice to hear we're ahead of them in something. Um, and then we've had the online safety bill. So Baroness Kedron has worked with all sides of the house to strengthen protections for children. It became law in October last year, and it, the government has hailed it as a historic moment that ensures the online safety of British society. Um, but I think there's plenty more to do to make sure that's the case. And I'm sure we'll end up discussing that after her talk tonight. So she's a very, very passionate advocate. Uh, she understands what she is talking about and she cares quite deeply about the impact of audio and video content to transform people's lives, but also on kids. So I'm very excited that you're here and look forward to hearing your lecture and the next frontier. And then we will do Q&A afterwards. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you, Alex. I always love uh, hearing my CV in someone else's mouth, and I think it might make my mother proud. <laughs> um, uh, and thank you all for, for coming out tonight on a rainy night, and hello to everyone who is online. Um, so I, I feel very privileged to be invited to give the Jocelyn Hay lecture so shortly after the ITV drama uh, Mr. Bates 
versus the post office. Mr. Bates was a drama that defies the drift towards algorithmically determined commissioning. And it also pointed to something very, very wrong at the heart of our democracy. It took only four hours of primetime telly to overturn 25 years of political and corporate negligence and malevolence. So it's a privilege to be speaking to an audience who have broadcast TV in their DNA. TV, film, theatre, music, the visual arts, architecture and design are all clues to how we see ourselves, both as individuals and in relation to each other. TV programmes that bring us together, whether the nightly news, Mr Bates, Strictly, Gogglebox, have a unique function in a world that has been personalised or more accurately atomized to an unhelpful degree because they create a shared reality. We live in a time of division, culture wars, disputed realities, algorithmically pushed to highlight our difference and to mirror our certainties until doubt and reason get rubbed out. The danger of these divisions, symbolised by our fragmentation, North and South, Brexit or not, urban or rural, nationalism or union, present or future, foreigner or friend, is that they are all binaries. Binaries that threaten to overwhelm our common interests. But we also have a new game in town, the synthetic. ChatGBT had an explosive landing from 1 million users within days of its launch to 100 million users within two months. Set up as a non-profit in 2015, OpenAI was, as I type these words, worth $86 billion and reported to be fundraising at a $100 billion value. Its impact on the public consciousness and the column inches in the press immeasurable. But perhaps most important for those who seek to develop technology that reflects societal values and common interests was the boardroom battle in which the chief executive, Sam Altman, was fired and rehired in less than a week. A knockout blow to those who cautioned caution. It was not responsible innovation but commercialization that won that first bout. The excitement of being able with a few quick prompts to have President Biden's State of the Union speech sung by the cast of Hamilton, or an ego prompt, I did do this, to find out what Baroness Kidron might say is wrong with the government's approach to child online safety was palpable. It caught our imagination and suddenly we felt as if the computer knew something more than us. And even as the problems inherent in this sophisticated best guess game of generative AI were beginning to emerge. And while commentators found increasingly humorous ways to use the newfound power to mimic human behavior, a considerable and very reasonable anxiety began to emerge from the creative community. Their work, so fundamental to the near magic outputs of large language models, was being scraped, sucked in and regurgitated with no acknowledgement of its original purpose, value or form. A lifetime's work, whether text, image or moving image, whether creative or factual, whether academic or entertainment, could be surfaced and hidden simultaneously. Surfaced by emerging as a near likeness without acknowledgement of its creator, hidden as an infinitesimal part of something new that could not have been manifest without it, but no longer had the same purpose. To many, it feels like a close hand card trick. Along with the wave of awe and wonder, 
ChatGBT brought to town the tech bros, warning that the monster they'd unleashed would create misinformation at such scale that to know anything would be impossible, that most would be left without a job, and that robot weapons would decide who was the enemy. In short, the scale of decision making that the new models allowed was on course to bring down society as we know it. They were simultaneously the authors and Cassandras of existential threat. In one scene of Mr. Bates versus the post office, a very unhelpful voice manning the Horizon helpline instructs the distraught postmistress to click on the screen and doubles her putative debt from a little over £2,000 to more than 4000 Nothing material had changed. No cash had been received or taken. No stamps given or received. No benefits demanded or dispersed. It was just the computer doing its thing. As we've seen and kudos to those who commissioned, produced, wrote, directed or played any part in it, Mr Bates created a storm of empathy and outrage. In Mr Bates, we saw corporate entities enabled by governments asleep at the wheel outsource the bugs of a technological system onto the least powerful, in this case, the sub-postmasters. And it felt horribly familiar. Missing a precious GP appointment because the parking app doesn't work? Hanging on for hours at the HMRC to find your question must be dealt with online, but online there's no answer to your question. Trying to contact an airline from an airport when your flight is cancelled only to realise you're texting with a bot that doesn't do multiple destination trips. Or in my case, a text every morning from a medical device that had been surgically removed from my chest in 2021. There was no one to ring, no one to contact, just the daily reminder of a near-death experience in the form of a distracting alert. Until very recently, someone suggested I text the word stop. Not subtle, but unbelievably, after more than a thousand messages, it responded. You have opted out and you will receive no further messages Everbridge Everett. I had never heard of Everbridge before then. Now, I realise at this point I sound like a tech de detractor, and, and I want to say not so. I'm an early adopter in so much as I had a webcam so early that I set it up and I suddenly realised I had no one to video call. I'm a tech optimist in so much as I see and believe that digital technology will play a starring role in helping us solve many of the issues society faces. Which is not to say I don't regret, hugely regret, that technology that could contribute so much to human flourishing is so often cannibalized by those who seek vast profit and even vaster power. Much of the work that I've done in Parliament and beyond is about technology as it intersects with children, specifically designing and regulating it to respect their privacy, account for their development journey, and observe their rights in full. In that capacity, I've been involved with others in drafting and passing the General Comment 25 that sets out how children's existing rights under United Nations Convention apply to the digital world. The age appropriate design code, which Alex has already mentioned, requires greater privacy from digital services likely to be accessed by children. And indeed, the UK's Online Safety Act, which has brought in a swathe of new legal and regulatory demands that should, if implemented successfully, um, make a significant difference to building the digital world that children deserve. And I've contributed to legal and treaty frameworks internationally in the knowledge 
that while the first billion children online are predominantly in the global north, the next billion will come from the south, particularly Africa. My focus and that of the Team at Five Rights Foundation is on making safety, privacy and rights by design an industry norm. This focus on upstream, or as the lawyers prefer, ex ante, design and governance invo involves a broad range of strategies to ensure that children remain participants in the digital world, but in, with recognition of their rights, their development stage, and with mitigations for the vulnerabilities associated with their age. And among the issues, the perennial issues that come up is of course that of child sexual abuse material. The creation, distribution, consumption of CSAM is illegal almost everywhere. Here in the UK, CSAM is covered by at least four separate laws, the oldest of which is from 1978 and the newest from October last year. But as yet, the models or plugins, sometimes referred to as LORAs, trained on and specializing in the creation of CSAM are not, allowing for an eye-watering rise in AI-generated child sexual abuse material. The creation of CSAM is now unfettered by the friction of real life. A child's photograph scraped from a school website, social media, or an advert, combined with this code built on pornography can be individually created to match the bespoke wishes of a disordered sexual imagination. Images proliferate that may be any combination of a real child and a synthetic act, a real act with a synthetic child whose physical attributes have been molded from a cacophony of prompts, bigger, bluer, sadder, eyes with tears. For a shockingly small amount of money, you can order up a scenario of your choice using a picture of a neighbor's child or a family member. And while some claim, as they did in the recent case of a child's rape in the metaverse, that there is no victim, this is not a victimless crime. CSAM created in vast quantity, the numbers of people engaging it is rising, and it is being normalized. And the police believe that rehearsing these scenarios online emboldens perpetrators and shortens the time it takes them to take those same actions offline. And anyway, would you like your child or a friend's child's image to be used in that way? My point here is that in this highly legislated area of digital content, we have once again allowed those who own the means of production to avoid responsibility for what they enable. We have been slow to understand that the code itself is not neutral and that in the name of innovation, we keep on outsourcing the social cost. We are again, allowing tech companies to scrape our data, build powerful systems with no corresponding societal responsibility. The reason that I am setting out this miserable scenario in some detail is because it offers three important lessons in a period in which the shouts of existential threat from those who are creating the threat drown out the more orderly voices that call for technology to be deployed without creating an accountability gap. First, we have laws in many of the areas that are causing concern. So before raising the alarm about existential threats of the future, it would seem prudent to look at the present and see how our existing rights and laws do apply or could be adapted. I've just applied this thought to the CSAM content, context and indeed, I am laying an amendment to a parliamentary bill to try and bridge the gap. But I could make the same argument about intellectual property. 
data protection rights, employment rights, as indeed collective bargaining, the Hollywood writers, uh, as the Hollywood writers just did on collective bargaining about their relationship to AI, consumer rights, safety standards, what about human rights, children's rights, etc. How would the sub-postmasters' lives had played out differently if we routinely made companies who sell, supply, or deploy technical systems responsible for their impact. Every complex computer system has bugs. That's not hyperbolic rhetoric. rhetoric. It was said to me a couple of weeks ago by a colleague, a professor of computing at Oxford, who in his spare time acts as a consultant to some of the biggest tech companies in the world. His specialization, finding bugs. Second, the language of existential threat where AI will replace humans is something that disempowers most of us. We <laughs> feel it's just too big, too amorphous a problem. But ask us if we want to supercharge the creation of CSAM material, I would hazard a guess that the answer is no. Or if it's okay to have facial recognition trained on white faces so a black head teacher, visitor, parent, child is not considered human and cannot pass a school security scanner. Again, no. And I have the picture that proves that exact case, a blackhead teacher who could not visit a local school because she was not recognized by the security system as human. Whether we think accounting systems should be designed with a back door by which an unknown unauthorized person can change the entries with impunity, again, no. You all in this room are communicators. You know we have a language that provides for shared human values. And that language gives us agency and a possibility of a critique which allows for legislative change and it allows for upholding societal rules. The language of existential threat does not. Nuclear, biological weapons, disease contagion, even climate change, all have the capacity to bring the world as we know it to an end. On the first two, the global community curtail both development and spread to a degree of success that has at a minimum uh, prevented global annihilation so far. Um, the pandemic saw human agency at scale as every part of the world moved to contain the virus. And perhaps climate change is simultaneously the best and worst in ex example in that we see a struggle for human agency over vested interests in which enormous equity disparities between polluters and polluted, between the natural world and human behavior between short-term politicians and businesses and the longer-term interests of the young. This battle is in full swing and offers a glimpse of how it is possible to make a question so big that it creates an environment in which the immediate and practical actions that might really contain the threat are overlooked in favour of an as-yet unidentified silver bullet that will save us when the time comes. And the third, in this election year, and I say this as a crossbench peer who neither has a party nor a vote, uh, because prisoners and peers do not get to vote, um, in this election year, we must pay particular attention to AI's extraordinary ability to create synthetic truth. Because the story that I told at some length about CSAM is as true of mis- and disinformation as it is about abuse scenarios. And here, let me tell you a very short story. I often do workshops with children and before Christmas, whilst doing a workshop uh, with 12 children between the age of 13 and 19 on AI, uh, we fell into a conversation towards the end of the session about the structure of parliament and government, the official opposition, minority parties, civil service, etc., 
uh, me telling them how each of those things did or didn't work together. During which I explained that Rishi Sunak was prime minister, but Keir Starmer was ahead in the polls by 21% and might in fact be the next prime minister. We discussed at some length the attributes they felt that a prime minister should have. It was interesting. At that point, I said, I'd seen a video from Keir Starmer's private office in which he was berating his staff, cursing and humiliating them. Their condemnation was fast and furious. Their vision of leadership, which had been thoughtful, sophisticated, generous, was smashed by this new information and they withdrew. And I, and I really feel that's important. They withdrew in the direct sense that they did not think a man who behaved like that should be prime minister. But they also withdrew emotionally from being excited and in the conversation to feeling that things once again, and forgive my language, were shit. Which is when I told them about the Pope's puffer and Biden's fall and the London mayor's voice. And we had a conversation about mis and disinformation and the implications for elections in the US, UK and India specifically. In election year or in any year, it is dangerous to have information environment in which the synthetic passes for the truth unchallenged, not only because those who are wrongfully accused will suffer, but because those who believe will suffer. And as someone who routinely sees synthetic material of every possible kind, including pictures of myself as a terrorist at demonstrations I was not at, as a showgirl doing a performance I wasn't, and as Superman, which I wish I was, but I'm also not, I would like you to believe me when I say, if I did not know I wasn't there, you wouldn't know the difference. I wouldn't know the difference. Which is why it is urgent to reclaim our public space, our communication space, our narrative space, and our collective truth. The language that suggests AI is too late, too difficult for us to deal with is part of decades long deliberate strategy of tech exceptionalism that has privatized the wealth of technology and outsized the cost, outsourced the cost to society. We do have agency and we must exercise our democratic power to ensure that our common interests are served. It is tech exceptionalism that poses an existential threat to humanity, not the technology itself. AI is built, used, pervaded by business, government, civil society, and as I've already pointed out, criminals. It's part of the story of the sub-postmasters, part of convergence of media, and it's part of the choices over which we still have agency who owns the AI, who benefits, who's responsible, and who gets hurt is at this point still in question. Which brings me back to why it, we in the UK with our unique ecosystem of broadcast TV, with our national obsessions of house hunting and watching other people cook, with our incredible history of drama production, must continue to value and insist on the opportunity to watch. I am Ruth, Small Axe, Peaky Blinders, and Mr. Bates versus the Post Office. To hear the nightly news from sources that acknowledge there is a common reality and reflect our identity as people, as people that is defined by place and history, defined by respect for different values, and most importantly, defined by a commitment to a democratically arrived at, perpetually affirmed and reaffirmed common reality. There is such a thing as society. And perhaps if I can, 
just divert for one second to mention my own interactions with our host, Channel 4. I started my career here with one of the very first Film 4s that was also the first film of both David Thewlis and Clive Owen, Broom. That was at a time when I could count female directors on one hand, in fact, probably little more than one thumb, actually. I made a documentary here about sex workers for the religious programming strand. But it was at the time so worrying to the channel that they asked me to record an on-screen disclaimer and take personal responsibility for the content of the documentary, which I did. I made a crazy version of Cinderella for New Year's Day 2000, not knowing if the century would begin with the predicted Y2K computer meltdown or Kathleen Turner in full flood as the wicked stepmother, which I think both of which were a pretty terrifying prospect. And almost a decade later, a documentary about the sculptor Anthony Gormley. At that time, the Channel 4 controller wrote to me, saying that the film stopped time. And I believed then that it was a compliment, but as I typed it, I did worry that it might have been a complaint. Um, and in more recent times, I've been a contributor on Channel 4 flagship news, a clear example of how an hour of thoughtful news can trump 24 hours worth of chasing the latest. My experience provides a fleeting glimpse of the extraordinary opportunities that the channel has provided to successive generations of creators, performers and participants to reflect and comment on diverse subjects in multiple formats, taking risks without abdicating responsibility, giving opportunity on both sides of the camera to many including me, who may have struggled to be heard. So as we move towards a convergence of media, perhaps the question is, how much of the culture and quality of the legacy broadcast media we should fight to retain in the brisk march to digital first? The traditional broadcast sector, subject to regulation, chartered to public service and regulated for the common good, are being pitted against an offshore cartel unfettered by anything but a share price, protected from responsibility for their impact by US law, Section 230, weaponized by the US courts, mirrored across the globe and ruthlessly defended by eye-watering levels of lobbying. Tech now spends more money than the gun lobby, tobacco, big pharma to keep legislation and regulation at bay. Meanwhile, social media and its associated businesses counterintuitively are built to address individuals at the cost of our common experience. And while the sector vaunts liberatory uses of tech for the individual, the public space has been rapidly privatized and held in the guardianship of a small handful of gatekeepers who've brilliantly managed the institutions of state law regulation to ensure profits are privatized and the costs regressively democratized. Streamers and video on demand services are deliberately designed to offer a personalized world. When I choose content based on my interest or characteristics, I'm offered more of the same. While it feels comforting to be reflected, if it automatically denotes, demotes content based on other interests and alternative characteristics, then I am separated from my fellow viewers. Video, images and text on digital products and services do the same, but supercharged. Even hesitating for a moment over an image changes the algorithm, which determines what you see next, which then determines what you might see in the future. You don't even have to click 
to be captured. In the fractured world in which we've outsourced decisions to automated systems that do not understand, but powerfully act on the information they hold, it is ever more important that we all see ourselves in the context of each other, and occasionally even at the same time as each other. A task in which, with which broadcast TV still plays a pivotal role, and I would argue excels. Now, I want to very briefly acknowledge the role of the BBC, which has suffered an unwarranted ideological assault on its core purpose. And while I do not see a straight road forward, I'd like to put to bed the notion that the battle for control of our attention is between the BBC and commercial TV, radio, local press, or even the streamers. It is, of course, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, X, TikTok, Snap, or the pushy demands of e-commerce that dominate our cultural information technologies. We may disagree on the specifics of funding the BBC or feel disappointed about what's missing or who's underrepresented or poorly served. But let's not misunderstand the purpose of a national broadcaster or the PSB system nor widely more widely. Neither culture nor politics is a zero-sum game. It does not follow if social media or streamers have content, we need none in our collective hands. Nor does it follow that because this generation of young have been hijacked by the persuasive design strategies of an advertising business model, that we should plan that future for the next generation. The PSB system offers the opportunity of a contemporary and collective vision of what binds us. This is a crucial time in which money rules, politics is discredited, nation states weakened, and the international community divided, divided by layers of self-interest and proxy wars. This is a time in which something that can be shared may also, at the very best, allow us to discern a collective past. path. Technology is not a replacement for human decision-making. It's a brilliant and powerful tool for crunching information. It can do accounts and mess up accounts. It can identify breakthrough patterns that will transform medicine and misidentify faces of the criminal because of the color of their skin. It can transform the imaginative worlds in which the stories you in this room make and create child sexual abuse with no limit to the horror depicted. It can capture the truth of an injustice on a smartphone. It can create a lie that is unjustly popularized on that same smartphone. We have two jobs. One is to insist that democracy runs technology and not the reverse. That is the job of lawmakers and the electorate. The other is to hold up a mirror to the world, a mirror that builds a collective experience, contributes to a shared reality, speaks of a common truth, and reflects our multiple paths. That is your job, and it could not be more important. Thank you. Wow, I think I speak for us all saying that was barnstorming and hair raising and important and scary. Um, let me, so I'm going to ask uh, questions and then throw it to the audience for questions, but we have some pre-prepared questions. Okay. But can we just start with that concept of the public square and the room for public debate and um, that what we've seen is the opposite of the broadcast stream talk about the BBC and public service broadcasting and a little bit asked that's about broad it's about the same thing for everyone mm. and it's about the principles of how do you get debate how do you get disagreement how do you enjoy arguing mm. um or debating or discussing and how do you learn to accept and tolerate a different perspective maybe with that changing your point of view over time or at least allowing for a range and a diverse set of views and we know that algorithmic content, as you talked about, takes you further and further into a smaller and smaller or more extreme 
space, but certainly further from the opposite opinion. What do you think we have to do, <laughs> not just broadcasters, but what do you think are the paths to how we reclaim that, how we reclaim that public square? I mean, it's, it's a, <laughs> that is a difficult question. I mean, I, th I think that there is- I think is you can a, handle it. <laughs> I, I think, I mean, I think two things. I mean, one in a really practical sense, I think those of you who still have the hand on the tiller have to be really thoughtful, conscious and robust about trying to create environments in which that debate can happen um, and find ways and 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 uh, methodologies, if you like, your formats, I think is yeah. probably a better word, formats in which truths can be established, even different sides of the same truth, but actually do a full scale attack on things that are untrue. And I think that's a very important task. And it's it's something, you know, that, that traditional bro broadcasters can do, should do, and they should do more of, and especially in this year of elections, more of. I think the other thing is that to perhaps to, to you know, more generally, that I, I would like to see a little bit more consumer power. I mean, I don't use most of the services that I find toxic, and a lot of people I know <laughs> do. And they think they can beat the system. And I just want to say the house always wins. And it's not that there's not some good factors of it, but I think we have to march with our feet. Mm. Because actually, if anybody was saw the 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 you know the thing at Congress um last week at child safety and the five the five big companies are there and the senators all shouted and the world listened two days later. Meta's share price went up, the biggest rally in a single day, $197 billion. You know, we've got to work out where our values are and we've got to start spending our money appropriately. Well, I think you're right. Obviously, I think you're right. Um, although I'd say that's positive signs, right? We did a couple of studies over the past two years on Gen Z. Mm. One is... 19% of them have turned off social media, at least for a period, not permanently, but for a period because they recognize that it's not healthy. That's not, it's it's a good sign. Mm. It's a good sign of change. The other thing is if you, if you study and focus group them and separate video into different times, uh, different types, the algorithmic scroll mm. of the doom scroll when you're on the bus or in the bath, um, they feel negative about they, they feel that afterwards, although they did it intentionally, they feel vacuous, they feel dissatisfied, it made them feel empty. So there are positive signs when people can recognise those emotions, but it's not enough. Because to your point, the spend on lobbying and the fact that there is no recognition of these platforms as publishers, and therefore there's no responsibility to your core point, there's, there's no accountability, there's no responsibility, doesn't look like it will change. I, th I think that's right. And I think I'm also very conscious and particularly around the kid pieces that, you know, we also took the playgrounds away. We also got fearful about letting them out in the street. We also got, you know, it's also about what's not there as well as what is there. Mm. And it, it's also about if, if we are digital first, as people say, I think even your press release I, I said it uh, yesterday yeah. uh, says digital first. You don't want to be legacy know. first. Yeah. No, no. Where, where, to... where are they? Where are their bits and where are the bits where they can go? So it's not just about taking people out. It's about what what remains. And so I think that's that feels very important to me. I'm, I'm uh, my experience as well is that a lot of young people, you know, are very articulate about the elements that they don't like, but they also express that they don't have a lot of choice. No, and, and what you see in studies with young people is that trust um, has reduced significantly in government. Engagement with democracy has reduced, especially over the past 10 years, because they haven't seen positive examples of it working for them. So that's particularly true with the kind of economic hardships that they've been through. And that's obviously a very dangerous factor combined with this. Mm. But have you seen, being a bit more positive, have you seen examples of tech companies that you think have harnessed things positively or have made good change or who stand out from the others? 
Yeah, I, th I think that I think there are some, and in fact, uh, Sonia Livingston, Professor Sonia Livingston's in the audience here, and and we uh, work together, and she did a fantastic uh, piece of work with with on um, child rights by design, and it was picked up by Lego and Sesame Street. Um, you know, so so there are people who who corporately want to do the right thing, mm. and I keep on coming back to this point: is we need business rules. This is about corporate rules rather than about communication rules. And we keep on failing because we keep on looking in the wrong direction, mm. you know. Um, but I think it's interesting in relation to the online safety bill that OnlyFans has come out and really tried to do age assurance in a very, um, you know, careful way. Which is not the way. company you would think would be first on it, but yet is, no, is doing it. They are doing that and they are trying to be a leader in their sector which is an adult sector so it's not uh, and and actually recently uh, five rights i can't say which one but but they've been working with a gaming company and uh, in fact five rights wrote to them and said you know we know you're breaking the the data law yeah and we'll either help you redesign or we'll shop you to the regulator your choice and we spent many many months helping them actually adhere to mm -hmm. the law and give much, much better, le less toxic games to children. I think, you know, these are small things, but I think that the regulation and the wave of regulation, remember we are not, a, we are an island, but there is also European regulation coming. There's Australian regulation. The Nordics are up to it now. I just came back from Stockholm, you know. Uh, uh, so I think this is a wave in which we are going to get a different um, set of, principles about how you start behavior. do you think that we as the uk sometimes we as the uk like to say we're ahead on things but maybe we're not always um uh do you think that's said with no political opinion whatsoever for the record uh do you think where do you think we stand like do, are we ahead are we behind are we kidding ourselves where where does this best where will we end up I, I think we were very a ahead and then it took seven years to do the online safety bill. So we sort of got a little bit behind. I think on on the subject of um, of children and the digital world, we are ahead. And that's partly because we have standalone data regulation that has been world leading mm -hmm. and has shown the way. And partly because that particular piece of regulation cited um, the Convention on the Rights of the Child. And what that did was change the age of adulthood online from the 13 that was being purveyed, yeah, to 18. And so consideration of older teenagers has become a norm in all other mm. regulation all over the world. Mm. So I think we have done some very, very important things here, and we are a bit ahead. But uh, I do think that for real change, what happens in Europe is something mm. that we... Do you need. think the online safety bill will change that for us? Do you think the, imp the, the putting it into practice now, which is what needs to happen to make sure that the, the teeth in it are used, um, do you see signs of that happening? Do you see signs of companies changing their behaviour? Yeah, I mean, what happens is as soon as you get a bill, they start going, oh, we were going to do it anyway. And there's a whole raft of changes that get announced and that's already begun. Um, ultimately, you know, it's on Ofcom. They've got really incredible powers if they use them well. And if subsequent, you know, if gov this government and any future government gives them the political bandwidth to use them well, it will be a sea change cool. in the lived experience there's a few ifs. of children. There's a few ifs. There are a few ifs, but these are the institutions yeah. that we have. And, 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 and you, this and, is novel. And you will have public service broadcasters, as they all are, applying the same rules online, choosing to do that in all their content, because that's what we're motivated by, Yeah, or should be. Um, but that's what we're up against. So um, you've had enough fear of me talk. So I'm going to throw it open to the audience. If you don't have anything, I've got more. Go ahead at the back. Oh, there's a mic coming. Yes, just in the back row. Hello, Beban. Greg Childs from the Children's Media Foundation. I wanted to pick up on something uh, that you said about, in a sense, the lost audience, mm. a lost generation. Um, we're very concerned about the numbers um, of children who are now accessing almost all of their media mm. in 
in social media on on YouTube, TikTok, and whatever else, and with very little reference to public service media in general, and hardly any experience of it, uh, other than some family viewing. Um, and we we wonder whether the time has come to move further on. And I wonder what your opinions are on this from uh, regulating against harm towards regulating for good. So the concept of renewing the public service compact completely for the 21st century and considering how do you create public service for the for the platforms in which they're actually watching? What do you do? either with or to those platforms in terms of regulation mm. to make them surface and indeed help to fund yeah. public service content? Uh, well, listen, first of all, I think it's a great question and I hugely regret that most of the conversation around uh, children online is about preventing harm because I do think the biggest harm is the things that are in the way of them doing, you know, of of of, of participating in in ways that are not nudged and shoved and and attention seeking. So so absolutely, I'm very sympathetic on uh, uh, about that. I uh, I do also think that we need a new compact, and I and I think it has two parts. I mean, one part is. You know, if they are going to broadcast, which they are, then I think that they should be brought into the system and have to deal with the issues about audience and representation and being and, and value. Being publishers. Yeah. You know, the, the, the other people in this room have to deal with. So I, I absolutely do. Um, and I also fear and I, you know, I, I had so much bad news in my in my lecture. I didn't want to overplay it but i also fear that the psbs in chasing the audience will turn into the platforms instead of actually holding on to the very thing that it is that we need so so within that i think i'm agreeing with you and you know if i ran the world which i don't you know i would invest hugely in uh, public service broadcasting on and offline i would absolutely you know have a have have you know all of those audiences properly looked at and in particular i would look completely differently about how media is presented in schools mm. yeah, completely oh. you know and and in fact lindsay who is my co-founder of, of what is into film, you know, that whole idea of, of seeing stories and seeing narratives and seeing people outside of yourself was our very early idea about the experiences children weren't having. So, so yes. Well, well if, you, if you wanted to run for running the world, you'd probably get this room's <laughs> vote. Um, right, I've got five minutes left, I'm told. I don't want to get in trouble with the VLV. So we'll do two more in the room and then is there any online that we need to take or are they not coming yet? Okay, go ahead. Oh, Mike's coming. Thanks, Steve Barnett, University of Westminster. Uh, I just want to pick up on the, your answer to Alex's last question about Ofcom, um, because uh, many of us are pretty disillusioned with Ofcom's inability to implement its impartiality regime, um, where it feels, seems to be failing dismally. So my question really is, how much faith do you have in the Online Safety Act really, as you said, places an awful lot of responsibility on Ofcom to get this right. How much faith do you have in Ofcom's ability to do that, to stand by its statutory duty to citizens as well as consumers? And is it a matter of resources or is it a question of leadership as to whether it gets it right? Oh, that's a, that's a... So right now, the jury is out, they feel their responsibility and take their responsibility very seriously. Yeah, the actual impact of it is yet to be seen. Yeah, so I don't want to say it didn't work before it didn't work. And I'm very hopeful that it will make a proper difference. I mean, these are very serious new powers. They've you got know. the power. They've got the power. 
They, you know, the companies have to risk assess, they have to show how they're mitigating risk assess. You know, there's a series of things that we fought to put on the face of the bill, including the addictive loops, which I didn't talk about, but are very, very central to my concern about what's happening. Um, you know, and and they uh, and they can dictate terms to the companies. And there is a sense in which Parliament said, do it our way or get out of the UK. Yeah, it was a bold position that Parliament took. And I know that many of my colleagues are still watching. It's not that the bill has been passed and nobody's looking. Do you think we'd ever have that power in this country to go, no thanks, Facebook, no thanks, Snap, no thanks, TikTok? Do you think that could happen here? I think I think it could happen. I think those companies are so big that they would never want to be in that position or get themselves in that position. But I think some smaller companies will just go, we don't want to do all that we'll just go elsewhere. Um, I hope that elsewhere will gradually become a smaller place because other people will also mm. pass laws. Mm. So I, I think that's my my answer to you is that, that they are very motivated. Uh, I can't speak to their impartiality team. It, the impartiality seems to have been weaponized to such a weird degree that, that I'm not sure that any leadership could quite get that right under the current circumstances. But, but on the online safety bill, I do think they do need political cover. And so the question is also whether, you know, there's enough protection from the tech bros, there's not too much lobbying in and out of uh, number 10 and the White House, you know, where the tech companies go like there's a cat flap, you know, there's, you know, there are really political issues and you can't just hand it to a regulator and then say, do your best work. I think all of us in this room, all of us in Parliament, you know, and the political class, the government more, more, more fully have to stand behind because they're going to fight in the courts and that's going to cost money. Good question. Right. One more line and then how many minutes we have? So we've got a question here um, sent in um, by... Clive Lever, who's uh, representing the National Federation of the Blind, mm. and it, it's quite a specific question, but I think really interesting one. It's not one I'd considered. Um, how are we ensuring that any measures brought in to give parents control of what children and vulnerable adults, offspring, are accessing online will work for parents with sight impairments? It is an interesting question, and it is something that actually does come up in Parliament quite a lot. And the whole question of accessibility is something that that actually the tech companies are rather better on than <laughs> some of the other issues. Um, the thing that I want to take a tiny bit of an exception is that we really have to make these companies uh, by design and default. They have to be products that are reasonably safe for children. I don't mean that a child doesn't have any bumps and grazes. I mean that they're not actually pointing harm at them. And I am not the biggest fan of parental controls, particularly for older children. And it does concern me that if we don't get this right, what will happen is what we've been hearing recently and what we've been seeing in America, which is children lead supervised lives online from parents and you know think about yourself when you were a child would that be a good idea i don't think so mm -hmm. so i really i really just want to make that point but uh i do think it's something ofcom are aware of but the inclusive design inclusive design yeah um so i meant to finish on time um but i think we've got drinks yes we have more drinks and snacks and more time to ask questions outside we wouldn't get that wrong um so on behalf of everyone that was incredible for me. Colin, do you want to say anything else or are we going straight to drinks and snacks? No, no, wrap up. Okay, so <laughs> thank you. Thank you for answering all my questions. Um, so let me just add to those thanks. It really was brilliant. And absolutely exactly the kind of thing we need to hear. Thank you so much. And thank you, Alex, for sharing it so, so well. Just a couple of final remarks from me. Our next event will be our spring conference on Wednesday, the 24th of April. It's up in the suite now. And we'll also be having our annual awards at that occasion as well. So do please come. It's going to be a busy time for the VLB, of course. We've got the, the media bill going through Parliament. We've got the BBC funding review coming up. 
an awful lot for us to do. Which brings me probably to the next point, which is um, do please think and do what you can in terms of helping VLV, funding the VLV donations, putting us in touch with the kind of people you think we can turn to for raising money, because we are always short of money, like most small charities. So any help that anybody can do in that way would be very much appreciated. And do actually join the, the, the VLV as well, if the people here aren't members. We'd love to have you properly on board.